Hi, I'm Dr. Doug Adler. I'm a professor of medicine at the University of Utah in Salt Lake City, and I'm also a senior associate editor for gastrointestinal endoscopy. I'm joined today by Dr. Tufik Kashami of Cancer Treatment Centers of America to discuss his paper in gastrointestinal endoscopy, liquid nitrogen spray cryotherapy for dysphagia palliation in patients with inoperable esophageal cancer. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for uh, the opportunity to be here. So tell us about uh, where this study came from. What was your impetus to do this study in the first place before we get into some of the details? Uh, so uh, uh, I trained with uh, one of the pioneers in this uh, therapy, uh, Alvin Zafas, mm -hmm. in the Medical College of Virginia, and uh, he was very passionate about this and instilled it in me. Uh, I saw it uh, work in uh, many patients, but unfortunately there were not a lot of data on it. So it was mostly in the uh, level of expert uh, opinion. Uh, and as I focused my career on uh, cancer care, I wanted to make sure I incorporate something that I saw work and try to uh, gear the field towards offering patients more uh, options. So when we think about treating patients with malignant dysphagia in the setting of inoperable esophageal cancer, we have a lot of options. We have chemo, chemoradiation, stents, cryo, I mean, and to a lesser extent, we have things like laser and APC that everybody talks about but nobody really does anymore. Correct. Um, I assume you guys are using all of those modalities at the Cancer Treatment Center of America that you're working at. Uh, what made you pick certain patients to undergo cryotherapy as opposed to other therapies? So uh, typically in my practice I offer patients uh, the uh, options of many therapies. Uh, as you know, uh, with uh, palliation of dysphagia there's really no uh, uh, strong modality that's uh, uh, accepted over others, like the American Society of Gastrointestinal Endoscopy recommends stenting as first line. Uh, but we know stenting, well, when you look at dysphagia, stenting, look, they look great. But when you look at quality of life, the studies on that is, uh, is mixed. mixed. Although these patients have a poor quality of life in any event. Correct. So uh, when we offer patients multiple modality, we involve them in the, in the choice and some patients end up choosing this. And the study uh, focuses on the patients that chose this modality uh, for uh, palliation. And you included 49 patients in the end, um, and how many centers were those patients done over? Uh, in uh, a total of four centers uh, with nine operators, which uh, I think is one of the uh, strength of this study because it shows that the, this modality is not necessarily uh, as operator dependent as uh, uh, and as technically demanding as some other uh, modalities. And you were using spray cryotherapy with liquid nitrogen because there's liquid nitrogen and CO2 based systems and there's some spray ones that are within balloons and outside of balloons, but you were using the catheter based spray liquid nitrogen device. Co correct. And any reason you chose that device over other devices? Because there's a couple out there. Uh, uh, you know, training influences a lot what we do. And uh, also liquid nitrogen uh, tends to have a lower temperature freezing than, let's say, uh, CO2. Mm -hmm. uh, also, there are uh, support issues with the CO2 machine because it's, it's not as widely available and the support is not as uh, uh, available. And because the liquid nitrogen expands so much as it warms up, you have to use a venting tube Correct. right, for this device. Correct. right? If you're using it in their bottom or in their stomach or esophagus, you have to have essentially a modified NG tube hooked up to suction that's aspirating the whole time so you don't cause Barrett trauma. Correct. Correct. That's an absolutely uh, very important step in the procedure for safety. So tell us about some of your results in these patients. What did you find? So uh, we had uh, 49 patients, uh, 10 were female and 39 were male. And we found on average a uh, 0.7 point improvement in the dysphagia on a score from zero to four. So you were using the DSS, the dysphagia scoring system? C correct. And uh, this is with one, we had a total of 120 uh, treatments. And mm -hmm. so one treatment was associated with that. And uh, what uh, we found in practice that when you stack treatments then you tend to improve the dysphagia score uh, more with uh, with further treatment. What was your mean time between treatments? So uh, the range was uh, two uh, to twelve weeks. Mm -hmm. uh, the mean time was around four weeks. And what was it again? You may have said this, and I may have missed it. But what was the mean number of treatments per patient? Uh, uh, between two and three. Two and three. Two treatments and three. per patient. Yep. And was that until the patient's demise or until their dysphagia was gone to the point that they didn't need to come back or either? So uh, either. Uh, uh, most of these uh, patients uh, uh, ended up not needing another modality of treatment. Our follow-up was at, at least two months on, on all mm -hmm. the patients and up to the medium follow-up I think was five to six months. And uh, until patients either transitioned to hospice uh, or uh, lo were lost to follow-up and not uh, following right. up with our center. 
So at, at our center, and I work at a large cancer hospital as well, you know, we do a lot of esophageal stenting, and we also have this same device. We've mm -hmm. used it in this context as well. You know, I think one benefit of cryotherapy is they don't have to have, for example, a stent in. Um, the big downside is they have to come back a lot. And Correct. for example, our catchment area is over, you know, uh, over five to seven hundred miles wide, and it's a little difficult to bring mm -hmm. somebody who's five hundred miles away back every couple of weeks to drive, especially if they're from a very rural area. So, I mean, the downside of this is that it is a lot of treatments. The upside is they don't need a stent, although a stent works 24 hours a day, and even as the cancer progresses, a stent is always going to be working. Granted, its stents have their downsides, which I'll be the first to admit. Um, in 2018, based on this data, which patients do you think would be better off with a stent and which patients would be better off with cryotherapy? Uh, so we know that now uh, cancer patients are living a lot longer and uh, uh, I think it's very important to present them with multiple options and uh, individualize what works based on many characteristics. We continue not to have anything that is very superior to all the other modalities. And as we continue to look on the best way to to look for the best way to manage them, uh, presenting them with multiple options, I think, would be the best way uh, to go. <clears throat> so one last question I had, and this is something that we really grappled with. I think one of the downsides of cryotherapy is there's no dosimetry, right? You don't really know how much thermal energy you're delivering. You don't know how much the temperature is falling. I noticed in your, in your results, you were saying some people did two cycles, some people did three, some people did 20 seconds, some people did 30 seconds. I mean, if two cycles of 20 is very different than three cycles of 30. How do you decide or standardize what the regimen should be? Uh, correct, and uh, I think this is one of the best part of, about uh, this study is to provide some uh, acceptable uh, uh, characteristics for what is, you know, what is somewhat effective. So I think anywhere between, my current practice is now anywhere between <coughs> three times 20 to three times 30. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I think uh, this is evolving to be kind of a baseline of where we need to start. We need a lot of studies to determine what's really more, uh, the most effective. This study was not powered to determine the difference between these two. Mm. Uh, and I think prospective studies are needed. It'd for be very interesting area. to see eventually which amount of time and number of cycles is ideal, right? And maybe you could plan it out based on tumor stage or some sort of amount of bulking or length of tumor. It'd be interesting to work it out because right now, like I said, we don't have Co that at all. Correct. And we're actually doing now a prospective study that also looks at quality of life, not just as dysphagia, uh, dysphagia because I think dysphagia doesn't really represent the, uh, the issues that these patients uh, are dealing with. There are many other issues that dysphagia by itself does not uh, mm -hmm. really uh, show. Any last thoughts for our listeners? Uh, no, I think when we're uh, looking at uh, management of uh, dysphagia and esophageal cancer at this time and age, presenting multiple options would be, would be important. And we have to keep in mind patients are living a lot longer, so we need to have multiple options available to us. Excellent. And thank you for, uh, for yeah. this. Uh, Congratulations meeting. on your paper. Thank you very much.